Hola amigos, coming up in this episode. These huge pieces of mining equipment. In Spanish they're called turbinas eolicas. I think they're beautiful. There was a message there, the kind of message everyone dreads getting. So I'm in the town of Tierra Amarilla in northern Chile and I was woken up by lots of bird calls. No doubt these bird houses in the tree opposite had something to do with that. Heading south, I soon rejoined the Pan American Highway, which in many parts is dual carriageway, four lanes, two north, two south, which is just as well when you see it's used to transport these huge pieces of mining equipment, which is to be expected in Chile because mining forms such a huge part of the Chilean economy, especially in northern Chile. After a while I noticed in my rear vision mirror a convoy of trucks wanted to overtake me so I pulled over and that brings me to the next point of interest. These huge wind turbines twirling ever so slowly. In Spanish they're called turbinas eolicas and I don't care what people say. Some people say they're ugly, they're eyesores. I think they're beautiful. They're good for the environment and they're much prettier to look at than the smokestack of a coal-fired generating plant. Gotta keep moving. You notice now plants are appearing, cactus and low shrubs. The fact that there's plants here means there is some rain at some time in the year. So we're leaving the Atacama. Soon I had to answer a call of nature, so I pulled over in front of this mining camp, which looked pretty interesting. You can see the tunnel entrance there, but I don't know what they were mining. The hills here had abundant flowering shrubs and cactus, and they were so colourful they warranted a second look. Scientists studying these plants have found they have evolved to be hardy enough to survive in this harsh environment. They've evolved a unique set of genes to deal with droughts, extreme temperature swings, high ultraviolet and poor and often toxic soils. And the hope is that in the future these genes can be transferred to food crops to allow them to be grown in marginal lands as well. And the strange thing is, Mother Nature never stops evolving. It's not only plants that have evolved to the harsh environment, people have as well. According to one study, native people from the Cuesta Camarones region, which I rode through in episode 16, have evolved a gene that allows them to drink arsenic-laden water and expel it through their urine at a rate that is a hundred times more toxic than deemed safe by the World Health Organization. That's amazing. Next up was a straight downhill cannonball run towards the Pacific Ocean and the little town of Caleta Hornos. I decided to let the engine rip. It must be run in by now, I've done over 3,000 kilometres. The speedometer indicated around 120 kilometres an hour, but when I did the analysis on the GPX file, the maximum was only 99.6 kilometres an hour, leading me to think the engine isn't firing 100%. Oh, it's so nice to be on the coast with the sun and not a cloud in the sky and none of that fog they call Garua. This town looks more like a Midwest truck stop than a fishing village, but this still is the Pan American, the main highway, the main arterial road that connects North Chile with the capital. Lots of heavy traffic. I'll soon be in the city of La Serena, which is the second oldest city in Chile, founded in 1554 by that peripatetic conquistador Pedro de Valdivia. Around the mid-1500s, there was an impoverished ex-soldier living in La Serena called Juan Diaz, who claimed to have fought for John of Austria in Italy. According to legend, Juan Diaz fought with two local Biscayan aristocrats. He challenged them to a duel, which they refused, mocking his low status and poor clothes. Some years later, the two were found stabbed to death with Juan Diaz's bloodied sword lying next to them. It was assumed that Juan Diaz, then called Juan Soldado or John the Soldier, 
was responsible. The local priest denounced him from the pulpit and he was expelled from the town, deemed a persona non grata. Around that same time, piracy was on the rise in the Pacific shores of the Spanish colonies. The first pirate to land at La Serena was Sir Francis Drake in 1578, only 34 years after the city's founding. But the Spanish had been forewarned of the pirates' arrival and Drake's men were repelled by a civil militia. Legend says that a monk lived on a hill north of La Serena and he warned the town with smoke signals whenever ships were approaching. And this went on for several years. But one day they stopped and a search party climbed the hill and found the corpse of Juan Diaz wearing a monk's habit. And that's why this bridge is called Puente Juan Soldado, the bridge of John the Soldier. And that hill also bears his name. But piracy didn't end overnight. A century later, La Serena was sacked and torched by the pirates Bartholomew Sharp and William Dampier. Bartholomew Sharp later became the first Englishman to round Cape Horn heading east, while William Dampier, the first Englishman to explore Australia and circumnavigate the world three times, was also part of that crew. But here he's remembered as a part of a marauding mob, not a naturalist explorer like we learn at school in Australia. <laughs> in fact, Dampier and his men torched and burnt the town of La Serena to ashes when they were a bit slow in delivering a huge ransom. But the townspeople almost enacted their own revenge act of arson, which could have changed the course of history had it succeeded. And the plan was pretty ingenious. They killed a horse, skinned it, inflated it like a bladder, like a dinghy, and under cover of darkness, a man paddled out with a supply of combustible material, packed it around the boat, set fire to it, and then paddled back to shore. Uh, the rudder of the boat caught fire, but the Empire's men were able to put it out. And you just wonder, if that boat had sank and all the pirates had been marooned in hostile territory uh, on the edge of the Atacama Desert, you know, he would never have went to Australia, he would never have done all those round-the-world trips, and world history may have been a little bit different. Anyhow, after crossing that bridge, Juan Soldado, the Pan Americans skirted around the foot of Cerro Juan Soldado, which at 1,200 metres high gave a direct line of sight of two offshore islands where the pirates would have waited in anchor, uh, waiting for an opportunity to attack. Then, entering the town of La Serena, I did a few loops looking for a place to stay, and then I found this nice hostel. The Hostel Las Luces. The lady in charge here was really good. She arranged a wooden ramp and some helpers to get it up the steps. And then we parked it in the foyer because it didn't have a parking space out the back. You can see here, it's got a unique decor. I really like this place. Of course, I didn't want to leave my camping tent bags and everything there in the foyer, so I had to unpack and move it out the back to my room. Today, I had a good run and arrived early enough to go for an afternoon walk around the town of La Serena. So, armed with my little pocket camera, I went around snapping shots of anything that looked interesting, and there was a lot of interesting things. I really like this town, even the graffiti looks nice. This beautiful building is similar in style to other ones I've seen in Lima and Trujillo. And what about this one? The Hotel Berlin, it even had an old BMW motorbike parked out the front. I reckon this pastry shop looks really quaint. But then I saw this. <laughs> this wasn't quaint. La Barra Bohemia. On its glass doors, the owner had stuck dishonoured cheques and allegations of unpaid loans and bar bills dating back to 2001. Even a wedding that went unpaid in 2002. Now I was heading into a more working class area and I tried my hand at a bit of candid street photography. I guess I wasn't discreet enough though. <laughs> this pretty young Chilena has disapproval written all over her face. She probably wouldn't believe me if I told her I was actually more interested in the posters behind her head. The posters announced a Mexican circus troupe visited La Serena just last month all the way from Guadalajara in Mexico. This poster presents a different message one by the FPMR. They were formerly a communist terrorist group who carried out an assassination attempt on General Pinochet. It failed, but several other people were killed and they were renowned for bombings, kidnappings and other terrorist activities. Even after Pinochet was gone and democracy returned, they renounced violence in 1999, but as you can see by this poster, they're still pretty militant. So back to my accommodation at Hostel Las Luces. But when I got back to my room and checked my emails, there was a message there, the kind of message everyone dreads getting. 
My father had recently celebrated his 70th birthday, and my stepmother, who was a radiologist, urged him to see a doctor about a medical problem that he had, and he was diagnosed with cancer, and it was so serious they booked him in for emergency surgery the next week. You can imagine how I felt, and uh, I lost my mother at age 45, when she was 45 and I was in my 20s, to lung cancer. It's a terrible disease. It's hard on everyone because you usually die suffering. <sighs> what could I do? They assured me there was nothing I could do and that I should stay over here, enjoying my so-called holiday of a lifetime. But, you know, what can you do except worry and pray? Coming up in the next episode. This gold jewellery that looks so modern is what the conquistadors wanted to plunder. The skull of an extinct Native American horse. Oh dear. I was going very fast when I felt something break. I can't believe a bike only one month old would break like that.